Well, thank you, President Ellsberg. Three weeks, I feel privileged to be a Rotary Youth Exchange Council for Charlotte de um, Charlotte arrived in September from Lyon in South France, and she joined the um, family of Jennifer Sabino. Jennifer, if you please stand up. And she's currently living with the family of Becky Steinhoff. Please stand up. And her third host family will be that of Jason Bear. Please stand Thank you to all of you for welcoming Charlotte into your family. So <laughs> and now, Charlotte's going to share with you some of her American adventures thus far. Okay, so hello, bonjour, hola, ohio, avir, and welcome to my presentation, Fall Edition. Okay. Each week I'm so surprised and amazed by all the activities I do, and I'm 17 years old, and each time I experience a new thing, I will fight because I really don't know so many things. Like the whole experiences, uh, I went to a carmel where I bought a pumpkin. I uh, do an apple picking. I make apple pie, pumpkin pie, and I went to a football game with another uh, Rotary student. Uh, or more traditional activities like the traditional Halloween where I buy um, a costume with Robin. Uh, how I do trick or treat, and obviously I try. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I <just> should treat. <laughs> and um, I did breakfast with my neighbor Nicole. And uh, <clears throat> I went to a haunting house. So obviously, I tried. And uh, I tried a pumpkin and I cooked with sand. I also watched the, watched the best show of my life, uh, Week with with uh, Ted DD at uh, the Overture. Uh, I did um, one trip to Dodell with my marketing club. I went to Lake Geneva. I baked with Brian Pick and his lovely family. I went to a pottery festival and I had a party with Jen. And I also had my first Thanksgiving in Tennessee, going to uh, Nashville, Lebanon, Missouri, and uh, Chicago, Illinois, with my new house family. Speaking about Thanksgiving, I really would like to thank uh, everybody who have or will help me uh, in my experience, American experience, inviting me to sports games, great sports. Thank you. Thank you. So just a bit about uh, Kevin. Uh, he's, uh, Kevin Walters will talk about three generations of leaders over the last 90 years and how they have worked to ensure that dual missions of scientific advancement and philanthropic giving complement each other rather than compete, uh, and how they have established a cycle of innovation, uh, advancement, and philanthropic giving. Uh, Kevin is a PhD candidate in history at UW-Madison. Uh, that automatically makes him a good person. <laughs> Since 2011, Kevin has worked as the historian in residence for WARF, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, where he researches the origins and evolution of the foundation who provides historical expertise to the staff and the public. He holds an MA degree in humanities and an MA degree in history from the University of Texas at Dallas, as well as a BA degree from the University of Texas at Austin. And prior to moving to Madison, he worked for eight years as a staffing planner and forecaster for the Consumer Finance Division of General Electric. Kevin was raised in Temple, Texas, Although I have to tell you, I checked, because he doesn't sound like it either. Fraud. No boots, no hat. <laughs> His father, however, did once serve as president of a local Rotary Club in Texas that redeemed him. So, Kevin, welcome to the program. I'm glad you're here. Howdy, y'all. <laughs> Try to draw it. Uh, thanks, Elder, for the introduction. Yes, my dad was a past president of the Temple South Rotary Club in Texas. He's also a Paul Harris fellow, but for me, he was the Santa Claus of the Rotary College Party. <laughs> 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 so, um, I already had a good introduction, so I think we'll go ahead and uh, get the clicker here. I guess, where are we going? 
On February 1st, 1960, E.B. Fred, President Emeritus of the University of Wisconsin, wrote a letter to Thomas E. Brittingham, Jr., asking whether the university administration might be of any help in this difficult situation with Dr. Steenbach. Fred was referring to a disagreement between Brittingham, the President of the Board, and Harry Steenbach, Professor Emeritus of Biochemistry. 35 years earlier, in 1925, the two men had been part of a group of university officials and prominent alumni who created the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. Steenbach had turned over the rights for his lucrative scientific patents to the foundation, and Brittingham, who began as vice president, devised an investment strategy that made work a runaway financial success. Despite this decades-long relationship, correspondence between the two men repeated in 1959 when Steenbach, who never held an official position inside the work, demanded a standing invitation to all future meetings of the Board of Trustees. Brittingham bristled at Steenbach's request and then declined President Fred's offer of assistance. Tensions escalated from there until in the summer of 1960, Brittingham's exasperated colleagues went back to Fred for any suggestions concerning how to handle Harry. <laughs> Beyond the immediate clash of personalities, the argument festered because Brittingham and Steenbach, both men of legendary stature in Madison, held contrasting philosophies about the purpose and future of an institution that each saw as a crowning achievement of their personal legacies. On one side, Steenbach, whose work and vision had fostered more creation, <laughs> insisted that it was not primarily money that urged me to, to patent my invention, nor did I need an alumni trust for that purpose. He intended Worf to fulfill, in his words, the purpose of creating and preserving intangible values for the faculty and the university and their relation to the state and the general public. He believed that the foundation should pursue activities necessary for the advancement of society that the university might not be able to perform, or that the state government refused to fund. That's the Steenbach legacy. Worf should protect individual academic freedom by maintaining a close, open relationship with campus and pursuing a, a leadership role of its own in the most cutting edge areas of science and technology. On the other side, Brittingham's financial expertise fostered Worf's growth. Worf's growth. He described the foundation as, quote, an independent group for the furtherance of the best interests of the university and for scientific progress in general. He praised Steenbach's wonderful idealism and believed the trustees would remain true to that vision, but he was sure to emphasize that this idealism has been bolstered by the tremendous investment success we have enjoyed. That's the Brittingham race. Wharf must be an independent, professional corporation focused on innovative business strategies that maximize the rate of return to UW. The steambach brittingham kerfuffle, as I like to call it, <laughs> was in many ways specific to one moment in time, but it reveals a core question that every generation of Wharf leadership has had to face, especially during moments of transition. How can they balance the scientific tradition of steambach with the financial tradition of Brittingham? The easy choice will always be to abandon one in favor of the other, but the history of Wharf demands that these two legacies should not be a source of conflict, but instead, to borrow a phrase from the current generation, become part of a cycle of innovation. So to understand the deeper currents beneath the steambach brittingham kerfuffle, we first need to look at how, by 1960, each man viewed the history of Worf from a contrasting point of view. For Steenbach, Worf's success grew out of commitment to the scientific principles of open collaboration and experimental rigor. Through meticulous experiments in 1923 and 1924, he and his lab assistants proved that certain foods, when irradiated with ultraviolet light, could be fortified with vitamin D. At the time, that particular vitamin was known as the antirechritic property, because if added to the diet of children, prevented, and in strong enough doses, even cured the bone weakening disease known as rickets. Steenbach recognized the commercial value and public health benefits of this discovery, so he decided to file for a patent. He wanted to protect the process from false advertising claims and unscrupulous businesses, <coughs> and hoped any profits could be used to support future research. When he approached university administrators, however, they declined <laughs> to take on the financial risk, the administrative burden, and the political uncertainty involved with patent applications and patent litigation. Around that same time, the Quaker Oats Company, which had a standing relationship with UW's College of Agriculture, offered to buy the vitamin D process outright to enhance the breakfast foods. But Steenbach turned up his nose at the thought of selling his invention to a company. So when these first two options, university control or selling the rights, were ruled out of the question, Steenbach turned to a third option. There was an article in an academic journal, co-written by a chemist and a patent lawyer, which proposed a trustee corporation not for pecuniary profit, in which a few friends of the university having no connection with the university administration would patent academic inventions and donate the proceeds back to the school. This plan held great appeal for Steenbach because as foundation run by alumni, or friends of the university as the paper called it, 
would allow him to remain focused on science rather than being distracted by business matters or engulfed by university politics. So over the first half of 1925, Steenbach worked with College of Agriculture Dean Harry Russell and Graduate School Dean Charles Lichter to convince the University Board of Regents to approve the creation of an independent organization to administer faculty patents. The Regents Executive Committee did just that on August 22, 1925. You see the resolution right there on the slide. And soon after that, Quaker Oats agreed to the first non-exclusive licensing agreement. And over the following years, Steenbach helped build and oversee a laboratory that controlled and tested all of Ward's licensed products. In addition, to the benefit of Wisconsin dairy farmers, the lab also worked out that milk, not oatmeal, had the ideal nutritional composition for absorbing vitamin D in the diet. So by the late 1930s, milk bottles across the country carried caps emblazoned with a wharf irradiated vitamin D seal of approval, which became the predecessor for the red labels you'll find in grocery stores to this day. So hopefully you can see that, but that's a an actual milk bottle that the uh, peritomy director of investments of Worf found in a flea market, a friend of her sent in a flea market, and it has the Worf written around the side of that. <laughs> of course, this is what it looks like today. <laughs> so throughout this decade-long process of the Foundation's birth and coming of age, Steenbach remained gracious but never hesitated to point out that his work and his ideas had planted the seeds for Worf's success. Tom Brittingham saw matters somewhat differently. Heir to the fortune of his father's lumber company, he made a career out of investing in the multi-million dollar Brittingham Family Charitable Trust, his father's perhaps most uh, visible achievement is the Abraham Lincoln statue on Baskerville. Basker mm -hmm. While he appreciated the economic potential of Steenbach's patent, this is Brittingham Jr., and expressed a layman's admiration for scientific genius, Brittingham measured success in dollars, and in the financial instincts and sound business practices that brought in those dollars. So with that in mind, let's consider the same history from Brittingham's perspective. His work story begins in the summer of 1925, when graduate Dean Slichter recruited 10 University of Wisconsin alumni, Brittingham included, to help form a new patent management organization to support their alma mater. A few months prior, Steenbach had turned to Slichter for help, recruiting the friends of the university that would run the new foundation. And Slichter had leaned on a network of prominent UW alumni, most now living in New York and Chicago, who had been boosted to the graduate school years prior. Because the alumni first heard about the foundation from Slichter, Steenbach would later have to remind the board that he had given the idea to Slichter and not the other way around. <laughs> the alumni fondness for graduate school dean Slichter may have uh, had something to do with the gathering at his Lake Mendota College in June 1925, which, according to one of the participants recalling it years later, involves, quote, a most delicious fried chicken dinner and some wonderful flat shaped gray and cigars. <laughs> While the record remains murky about what happened at that meeting, which is why I have to use soft photos, uh, perhaps also because they had some brandy along with that chicken and cigars, it appears to be the first time that the alumni pledged financial support for what would become work. More important than the money, however, the alumni were, in Slichter's words, persons whose name will carry with it the idea of business ability and of financial responsibility, qualities they would demonstrate in the following months. Harry Butler, a partner at the Madison Law Firm of Olin and Butler, and a one-time regent of the, of the board, of uh, UW, drew up, articles, drew up the articles of organization. Five of the alumni agreed to serve as the founding board of trustees, including George Haight, pictured here, who became the first president. And then finally, on November 14, 1925, Brittingham and two other trustees, who were the only three who lived in Madison at the time, were present for the filing of the papers of the Wisconsin Secretary of State to create the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. And this is a picture of the original article of organization. So from that point forward, Brittingham, who became the founding vice president, developed an innovative investment strategy for Wharf funds that depended on purchasing common stocks. He rejected the conventionalism that investors should choose established blue chip stocks. Instead, he aimed to identify companies that would soon grow into the next blue chip stocks. As he explained it, you don't put your money on the thoroughbred that won the Kentucky Derby last year. You try to pick a horse that will win the next year. Such calculated risk demanded close attention to the markets, and the added uncertainty of nerves of nerves some of Brittingham's fellow trustees. The other part of this is that he believed in keeping everything fully invested. So at, at all times, more money was in the market and at risk. But it worked. The licensing income of the Quaker Oats contracts alone had made financial donations irrelevant. With Brittingham at the helm, Wars Endowment grew to such an extent that by the mid-1930s, gifts from the foundation allowed the university to maintain and even increase its research budget in the middle of the Great Depression and prevented <coughs> several graduate programs from going on. By the way, I should mention donations to Warfare, and of course, donations to the university are still very much appreciated. 
<laughs> so as you can see, the personal experiences of Steenbach and Brittingham led them to starkly different philosophies about what made work a success. Steenbach witnessed the experiments, and he emphasized the science. Brittingham witnessed the transactions, and he emphasized the finances. Despite these different viewpoints, the two remained friendly during the early decades, exchanging stock, stock tips, vacation destinations, and opinions on art and music. Nonetheless, an underlying tension marked their correspondence. Brittingham, in one letter, pokes fun at Steenbach's academic title, calling him, quote, Doctor of Divinity, and joking that businessmen like him were mere mortals in the shadow of scientific greatness. <laughs> in short, Steenbach was always the egghead, Brittingham was always the money bag. Their legitimate philosophical clash always had held the potential to turn into a personal grudge match. Indeed, the simmering frustrations of their opposing temperaments erupted in the open over a matter of months in 1959. The trouble began in September, with an angry letter sent by Steenbach to Brittingham expressing his suspicions that Wharf leadership had come to view the now retired biochemistry professor as a nuisance, an old man in need of placating whose guiding light had dimmed. Steenbach complained about, quote, the insulting attitude of the foundation, even though he had conceived the foundation idea, financed its beginning, and laid down the principles of its organization. He wondered whether a new generation of trustees and directors would continue to label me persona non grata and demanded that the board extend him a standing invitation to all of their meetings, which he insisted be ratified by formal votes and recorded in the meeting minutes. Brittingham, who after all had witnessed the founding of Wharf in person, in a quite literal sense, likely believed Steenbach had gone too far in claiming sole credit not just for the idea, but for the financing and the organizing, which Brittingham had something to do with. In any event, Brittingham replied that although the board held no animosity towards its founding inventor, Wharf policy had always prohibited university employees from serving in an official capacity at the foundation. And in that spirit, the current trustees would, quote, keep that line of demarcation a very strict one, by granting no such open invitation to anyone who held a position at the university, emeritus or otherwise. If that separation were to mean anything, it had to apply even to Harry Steenbach. However, as a show of goodwill, the board had voted to extend an invitation to Steenbach for the upcoming meeting, and agreed to hold similar votes in advance of any specific meetings he might like to attend in the future. Steenbach ignored this peace offer. November came and went with no word and no appearance from the eminent scientist. When he did finally contact the board, more than two months after the fact, he professed to be quite shocked and embarrassed that the trustees would limit my attendance to special invitations in favor of a policy of secrecy and exclusiveness, not to say discourtesy. If the board insisted on continuing down their current path, he warned that he would be forced to take his grievances home. At this provocation, Brittingham, never known as the Shrinking Violet, dug in his heels. In a long letter, said February 1st, 1960, the same date that he was read, which time to make peace, he reminded Steenbach that during his six years as war president, Brittingham had kept Steenbach appraised the trustees' actions through face-to-face -face meetings and personal correspondence. Despite that fact, Brittingham asked, did you ever bother to answer my many letters, most of which extended invitations to the next meeting? No, he did not. So let's not hear any more supposed neglect. Furthermore, the financial record we have obtained based on our own Brittingham investment theories entitled me to more consideration than you have shown in the past. And besides, what Steenbach interpreted as a policy of secrecy and exclusiveness is actually nothing but the result of the trustees maintaining their independence exactly as you originally outlined. Unwilling to leave it at that, the already volatile letter took matters further. Brittingham asked Steenbach to, quote, read this together with Emily, who is Steenbach's wife because I'm sure she could be helpful to keeping you in the big, keeping the big picture in view, away from the small, irritating details. <laughs> Worse still, Brittingham noted that you have never experienced the pleasures and troubles of bringing up children. <laughs> Since Worf had been Steenbach's only offspring, the professor must not realize that children often grow up to defy their parents' wishes. <laughs> In any matter, quote, those who create a business corporation do not also, also create the perpetual right to sit in director's meetings. The professor, who remained a bachelor until the age of 62, and part because he dedicated his entire productive life to the irritating details of scientific experiments. <laughs> he took this letter as a, as a low blow, and not without good justification. He refused to have any contact with anyone connected to the foundation in any way until he received a formal apology from the Board of Trustees. Even so, Brittingham remained indignant. In a note to E.B. Fred, and a week after the inflammatory letter to Steenbach, 
the, the war president wrote, I've never known Steve Bach to be satisfied with anything. <laughs> Thus, after you've heard his usual belly aches, I would suggest you pay no attention and go along merrily. <laughs> so to understand how the argument became so personal so fast, we need to review the tumultuous history that these two proud men shared in the 15 years leading up to their reserve squabble. Steenbach's dissatisfaction with the Board of Trustees had been building for more than a decade, ever since Worf dedicated his vitamin D patents to the public in 1946. In the years that followed, the Foundation's laboratory and staff devoted the same obsessive energy to Carl Paul Lake, another professor of biochemistry, as they had to Steenbach in the two decades before. Although about, although about half as lucrative when adjusted for inflation as the Steenbach vitamin D patents, Lake's patents on warfarin earned international acclaim when the drug became both a, a, a widely selling blood thinner, still used today, and a rat poison. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a presentation for another <laughs> Therefore, when the stubborn steam mock clash with the volatile link has happened throughout the 1950s, Wharf management tended to favor the young professor, the younger professor. They knew the future of the foundation depended in large part on the success of Warfarin and on keeping the foundation at least good graces. As it happened, the director of Worf, Ward Ross, was also very good friends with Carl Pauling because they both really enjoyed drinking beer, but then again, who doesn't? <laughs> Antagonizing Steenbach further, the trustees made three pivotal decisions between 1947 and 1956 to move the foundation's focus away from the patent management and research support that, as far as Steenbach was concerned, should be the bedrock foundation of the Worf. First, in 1947, the foundation completed construction on a new three story building on Walnut Street with dedicated space for control laboratories and offices for growing administrative staff. All expenses that Steve Bach viewed as excessive. You can see that picture at the top left, what was under construction. Second, in 1953, Brittingham, still vice president at the time, persuaded the rest of the board to offer what was called a life income plan, which is advertised there at the bottom right. In this plan, wealthy alumni could establish a living trust with a set monthly income distributed by Wharf that would then, and then the sum total would revert to the foundation upon the death of all the beneficiaries. Third, between 1954 and 56, three prominent families donated their land holdings in the Wisconsin Dells to Wharf, which made the foundation not only the majority stakeholder in concession stands and tour boats, you may know those boats are stocks, but also by far the largest property owner in the Dells, and that remained true until the 1990s and ultimately in 2000 when Wharf had sold off most of that property. More than ad hoc decisions, these three major developments in Wharf's history show how a new generation of trustees had come to understand their role as leaders of a professionally managed nonprofit foundation designed to provide financial support to the university. Besides patenting and licensing, they now control diversified holdings and laboratories, living trusts, real estate, and tourism. <coughs> Birmingham, who by 1956 had become both Wharf's second president and the last active member of the original board, became the leading spokesman for this aggressive, diversified business strategy. In a 1957 article published in Burns Weekly, there's a portrait of that and a graph that went along with it, he announced that through his shrewd financial planning, Wharf had built a portfolio worth $40 million, and that was after the $13 million already donated to the University of Wisconsin. To be sure, $14 million of that $53 million total had come from the licensing of Steve Fox patents, but the article's headline, as you can see there, and the subsequent news coverage painted a more heroic portrait. Brittingham, the bold investor, had bested the Dow Jones and turned little more than $900 in dues in a patent into a $50 million financial powerhouse that demanded Wall Street's attention. I should say, Brittingham wasn't all that snarky against him. He was actually pretty respectful of his article, but obviously headlines, when it's got reproduced in the Wisconsin State Journal, the Capital Times, the uh, Wisconsin alumnus, they tended to focus on the headline and Brittingham's picture. So Steenbach had reason to believe that both his contributions to Wharf and his personal values had been slighted by this $900 in a patent or an origin story. According to Steenbach, hard work and scientific exp expertise held far more value in the long run than financial speculation. Brittingham stocks and bonds may have tripled the value of Wharf's endowments, but without Steenbach's discovery and diligent efforts to responsibly commercialize his patents, the foundation would have had nothing to invest at all. Science, not money, should be the driving motivation of foundation strategy. Worf needed to be attuned to the latest advances across all disciplines in order to anticipate the needs of the most talented faculty on campus. But instead, in Steenbach's view, the new generation of leadership had retreated from public engagement. They loosened their high standards for projects to support and abdicated the Foundation's natural role as an innovative force in academic research. Of course, Brittingham could argue, with earned authority, 
that he and his colleagues had not strayed from Wolf's coordination at all. He believed they were thinking ahead and adapting to changing circumstances. Moreover, the traditions of campus politics and the philosophy espoused by founding President Haight and by the first director, Harry Russell, dictated that Wharf should make the money and let the university decide how to spend it. In Brittingham's view, Wharf should lead professors to experiment with research programs and allow the foundation to focus on growing an endowment that could shield the university from changes in government policy and other unforeseen calamities. And this wasn't a small point in the 60s because after Sputnik, as you probably know, the, the, the federal government began uh, escalating funding of research support. And other policy at the time, any intellectual property funded by that research could not be patented by the university. The, the, the government owned those rights. So disclosures for invention dropped precipitously in the 1960s. And Brittingham and trustees were aware of this and realized that if they wanted work to remain viable, they would have to adapt to this. Ultimately, work was pivotal in getting the Bayh-Dole Act passed, which changed that federal policy. But in the 1960s, they, were, they had no confidence that something like that could happen. So for all of these reasons, Brittingham and Steenbach had deep personal and professional investment in the direction work would take at the dawn of the 1960s. Sadly, the tensions between them remained high when tragedy struck. On April 16th, there we go. April 16, 1960, while driving near his home in Wilmington, Delaware, Brittingham had a heart attack and died at the age of 61. His father had actually died in a similar age while um, on, a, on an ocean liner coming back to South America, and his son, Thomas Brittingham Jr., or Thomas Brittingham III, were also died in a heart condition. In the weeks that followed, Brittingham's successors at Wharf eulogized the fallen leader taken too soon, but otherwise struggled with how best to come to grips with the lingering personal grievances between their fading forefathers. Consumed by the task of managing a still growing $55 million endowment and a professional staff numbering more than 100 people, they became exasperated by the persistent disgruntlement of Steenbach. Not only did the trustees have few, few ideas about how to handle Harry, they had no interest in hearing a lecture on what we have done wrong in the past. Having been more in tune with Brittingham's decisions and temperament, they tended to view the aging professor as a frustrated retirement, struggling with ill health, who risked tarnishing the reputation of Brittingham and the legacy of war. So Brittingham, or I'm sorry, Steenbach, his ang anger cooled a little bit and kind of got a little quieter after, after Brittingham's death, but he really wasn't still satisfied. So fortunately, much of the worry and hurt feelings dissipated a few months later, when the wisdom of President Emeritus Fred prevailed. After multiple letters and considerable co coaxing, Steenbach accepted an invitation to the October meeting of the Board of Trustees. The founder of Wharf, according to the minutes of that meeting, called Wharf a social experiment, an expression of freedom of action by a university professor, and a challenge in view of the circumstances that existed in 1925. Although he appears not to have mentioned Brittingham by name, he did pay tribute to the past and present trustees, stating that Wharf was now a great institution, regardless of some of the shortcomings, and the contributions of the trustees have been of inestimable, inestimable value to Wharf's growth. So that quote comes from the minutes. I imagine Steve Bott was a little bit more direct in some of these statements. So by inserting a reference to Wharf's shortcomings, Steve Bott confirmed Brigham's assertion that Steve Bott would never be satisfied with anything. But then again, Brigham was no stranger to hit strong behavior himself. Keeping their mutual stubbornness, stubbornness in mind, the question how to handle Harry takes on a wider significance. Handling Harry no longer means inviting him to board meetings. But it does mean doing justice to his scientific le legacy and to the investment legacy of Brittingham. Both men's strong opinions and their well-developed egos strengthened Worf by demanding high standards from the institution they loved. Over the ensuing decades, the foundation has continued to seek out a diversity of viewpoints. Strong-willed trustees with a variety of professional backgrounds, business managers and patent lawyer lawyers in the executive office, and brilliant and often eccentric professors who disclose the research. The give and take and the occasional heated disagreement among those groups have prevented Worf from buying into ill advised political projects or getting straight jacketed by untested abstract philosophies about how technology should be handled. Well, I should say most of the time. So we, because when it comes to history, there's always exceptions to the rule. And I should add that in history, as in the stock market, past results are no guarantees for the alternative. <laughs> but through it all, Worf has remained committed to two bedrock principles embedded within its founding mission and represented by the legacies of Steenbach and Brittingham. First, promoting and aiding research excellence at the University of Wisconsin, and second, confronting the practical challenges of encouraging technological innovation in the state of Wisconsin. Both commitments keep work connected to the sifting and winnowing necessary for individual <coughs> academic freedom, and to the idea that the university should extend to every corner of the state, which we all know is Wisconsin. Thank you.
Uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much for that. It's very informative. In your research, going through the wharf minutes, did you know any time that the wharf trustees took into account in the 50s or early 60s political leanings or political act activism of any of the researchers who were either whose projects they were funding or whose projects they were benefiting from? Um, I haven't found any evidence of that. I think there, there were certainly some discussions about that. I think the, the, the um, most evidence I found about that is from the Capital Times. One of the, uh, I'm forgetting the name, but one of the Republican candidates for governor was also involved in the Dells. And there were some stories printed about how, whether that was appropriate for Warp to be involved in the Dells or whether the Republican governor involved. But, um, really, no, I mean, Warp's role has mostly been to, to manage the, the inventors. But as much as anything, it's, it's the, it's the university politics that, you know, uh, Carl Paul Lake and Steenbach, that's the separate presentation I could get into, were, were very different personalities. Came into conflict with each other. Link once accused Steenbach of trying to quash one of his patents, and so most of the controversy was about whether uh, the trustees were listening to Steenbach too much or were actually pursuing the science. Um, but the kind of, the, in terms of political statements, there's nothing in the minutes that even suggest what party they were part of or, or what kind of. Um, I mean, they were they were very close to Carl Paul Link, who was a sponsor of communist organizations on campus, um, things like that. And Steenbach was, was Steenbach probably politically was sort of a coolish Republican. As I would describe them. So um, those conflicts were there. I don't think that it really rose to that level. I think the biggest also political um, involvement Worf had was during the New Deal when the Steenbach patents were challenged and were invalidated by a circuit court. And then ultimately Worf uh, uh, had a separate lawsuit to try to get that to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court declined to hear it. And there was a consent decree um, that was then, that's when the Steenbach patent was dedicated to the public. And so this argument, uh, at that time, that the Justice Department was accusing Worf of being involved in price fixing and things like that because it's thinking about patents. And that's sort of the political discussion about the role of antitrust and the role of patents, that kind of thing. Uh, but I would say those are the things I can think of in the top of the word of politics is to play the role of antitrust. Any other questions? Prior to the uh, federal government's getting heavily involved in supporting scientific research, would I be right in saying that the WARF uh, grant Faculty was really tremendous and important to the university. I would say so. I mean, the, the way that work is framed and the way the university is framed is that work is under a margin of excellence, and it's always been an issue from the very beginning. Harry Russell, who's the first director, uh, wrote a letter right when work was founded. There was actually some debate within the Department of Biochemistry about whether it was appropriate for a professor to be patented. What, what Harry Russell said was, if we don't take seize this opportunity to create a fund of our own, we're never going to be able to compete with private foundations. And we're never going to be able to convince, it's always, the way you put it was, it's always difficult to convince the legislature to do the right thing. And of course, we just want to do the right thing was the <laughs> um, the, the, the great book quote from Steve Hoff, writing in the 1940s, and he said, uh, he's talking about the purposes of the Research Foundation, he said, uh, a university should not be asked to fund its own research, but when the state legislature fails to have the intelligence to do that, we have to do it ourselves. Um, so, like, I, I don't want to create the impression that Worf has been able to replace that research funding, and, 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 and it has it's been very important. I think the most critical contribution Worf made in the early years was during the Great Depression, when state funding was going down because of shrinking state budgets, and, and they were able to step in. And there were a lot of um, graduates who were otherwise just gone to the office, and they created postgraduate fellowships to keep them around, and things like that. So it's, it's those um, knowing when to intervene and where to intervene to maximize the impact. And, and more freedom of operation helps you do that in a certain way, and I think that's the most important contribution. Hello, Karen Kendrick Hands. Has WARF been a model for other university research foundations? Yes, it has. In fact, it was when WARF was founded, it was there were only a few other people who had done something like this. There was the Research Corporation of New York created by a California scientist that preceded WARF, uh, and the, the Insulin Committee <coughs> in Toronto. Had, had also existed at that point. But after Worf's creation in the 1930s, there were a lot of universities who, who tried to start doing patents and, and organizations and foundations like that. And Worf was even more influential. So Howard Bremer, who was a patent counselor for Worf from the 1960s uh, to the 1990s, and it was the Meredith Car Car Patent Council up until when he, when he passed away a few years ago, was he actually wrote the text of the Bible Act. It was a, uh, the um, IPA, the Institutional Patent Agreements, he had written to, to uh, avoid to change the federal policy with the NIH. And the text of that institutional patent agreement became the text of the Bayh-Dole Act. 
and he became one of the sort of founding fathers of what's now called the Association of University Technology Managers, um, which helped create a lot of other universities. So after the passage of the Bayh-Dole Act, patent training explodes across the country. Uh, and there's a debate within the literature about whether it's the cause of the Bayh-Dole Act, whether it's actually the cause of what people like Howard Bremer were doing, and Norman Lapper at the NIH were doing in the 60s and 70s to promote this activity. But yeah, the short answer is that yes, what is the very influential, but it's also unique in the sense that most <laughs> technology transfer offices, as they're called, in the country, in fact, work, are their offices on campus? They're part of the campus. So when they make money, their money goes back into the normal university budget. Work being separate has been able to create a, create a research foundation. It's also unique in the fact that other organizations have tried to do something similar. They put the money into a foundation that maybe is a separate foundation they run themselves. Um, but a lot of times, it's it's very it's very unusual to find something as successful as the Steve Bob patents and as successful as the Link patents. The fact that those two things happen right away. That the work has as much more successful from a financial uh, perspective than anybody else. So it's unique in that regard. It's, it's separation and also it's success. Uh, <coughs> maybe the unique thing actually. Both uh, could you comment on Wart's role in the uh, establishment of WRD? Uh, uh, yes, I, can, I should probably confirm more to Carl and his question. Sure, so your question was Wart's role in terms of uh, WIN, which is the Wisconsin Institute's discovery. And the Discovery Building, which is so the Discovery Building houses both the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery and the Mortgage Institute for Research. <laughs> so Wharf, um, Wharf trustee John Mortgage and like Sasha uh, provided the money to create the Mortgage Institute for Research, and then Wharf helped build that building. Um, I'm a historian, but that's it's only like five years old now, so I have to explain it. I'm not trying to dodge the question of time. <laughs> But I think you know, uh, but that's the, that's the long and short of it. I think it's something that's, that will be interesting to watch. It's a, it's, a, it's a very innovative approach, and the building's great. I've presented it many times, um, and I think you know it's something to watch and see um, the where will the mortgage research is going in the future, how that partnership will be. Did you see anything about controversy about Wharf's role when the UW system was created? Um. I don't know about controversy. There certainly was a question in terms of whether how Wharf would be, like whether would, whether Wharf would support you know Milwaukee and that kind of thing. There was some debate about that. Wharf, Wharf was always just for Madison, and in more recent years, Wharf has created Weissness, which is which is does the same process for Wharf for the other branch campuses. Um, I haven't come across any issues with that in particular. I do know that uh, Bill Kelly, who was, who was a Wharf trustee and a Wharf president, was involved in the restructuring process. Um, but from what I can tell, it tended to work pretty, pretty smoothly, and I don't think that there was too many, too many issues at that point. But um, I'm still, I'm still working, so I may come across something. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kevin. Great job. Thanks for sharing the uh, annoying details. Yeah. <laughs>